Over the Board Chess is back. I'm so excited. All right, guys, what I'm going to do in this series is I'll be analyzing my Over the Board Chess games. The tournament is called the July Swiss. It's played in my local chess club. Physical pieces, 60 minutes on the clock, 30 second increment. I'm really excited to get back. Um, so in preparation for this tournament, I was doing some puzzles and doing some opening review, a little bit of chessable, and playing a few rapid games. And that's something we'll get into uh, as we go through this game, some tips that I think I could take away from my future games. So my opponent here is Michael Kern. He's a 1750 player, um, but he's someone that I've known since he was very young, and he's a really strong player. Uh, he's about 2,000 bullet on chess.com. Um, really good blitz player, you know, he has good instincts, and also he's strong strategically. So going into this game, I know he's probably already at least class A level. So the 1760 on paper, you can't really read too much into that. Uh, he went E4. The last time we played it was a London system when he was white, so he's switching it up a bit. And after D4, D5, we get into a Karo Khan. And I just recently, well within the last six months or so, published a Karo Khan course. And um, up above I'll put a card to see our Karo Khan videos as well. And there's also going to be links in the description. So he, he goes for the exchange Karo Khan. And he said after the game that he didn't really have a lot of this theory down. So he just likes to, to trade the pawn and, and develop naturally. So here he plays h3. And already here I'm out of book. I don't really know what the best line is against h3 because in almost every line we go we recommend bishop to g4 and I've been playing the Sicilian lately so even though I just made the Carroll course one thing that I haven't been doing is playing my games I haven't been practicing my Carroll lines um, so here I went back and forth for a long time between bishop f5 and e6 I ultimately chose e6 but I think what I should have done is gone for this line Bishop to f5, and now let's develop naturally, e6, c3, and now here we can continue with a similar plan to the Karo concourse by putting the knight on e7. White will probably try to offer the trade of these bishops, after which we can take, play knight g6, bishop to d6, and after all these trades happen, what's going to occur in the end is we're actually going to be going for this e5 break. And if you look at this position, white's just played very naturally. But we reached this end position, and now I get the e5 break. And here, black already has a comfortable advantage. So this is the type of position that I think I should be playing for in the Karo Khan exchange variation. So when I see this again, 5h3, I'm going to go for bishop to f5. Um, I did burn a lot of time on this move. And one thing that's kind of fun when you play over the board chess is you can take physical notation. So it looks like this. And throughout the game, I tried to jot down how many minutes we had left. Um, so by move 12, I was down to 30 minutes left out of 60, and Michael still had 52 minutes left. So that just kind of goes to show you like what can happen if you're not feeling confident in your openings. So after e6, Michael played bishop to f4. And here I went for a really quick trade, and the idea was I still wanted to go for this f6, e5 break. So even though that's my good bishop technically, opposite color of these light pawns, I wanted to go for this plan of e5. So now knight e7, bishop to d3, castle, castle, f6. I think all of this is fine. And now here Michael uh, shows his strategic strength and he plays c4. This is the critical move. So you see these pawns lined up. c4 puts this pressure on the pawn on d5. So this is exactly what Michael should do. And this really got me thinking. Um, I was trying to recall some other lines from the course. I know a6 is an idea here, followed by b5, and you can maybe like deflect this c pawn and then go for the e pawn break. But I spent a ton of time in this position. And I think in the end, probably what I should have done is taken on c4 and played b6. And the idea here is white has this isolated pawn on d4. So let's say knight c3. Um, I could play something like knight a5. 
bishop comes back, bishop to b7, and now you can see I have the blockade on d5, not allowing this d pawn to easily move, and my knight's probably coming up here next. So I think this is a better strategic plan for me to play for in this position. But in the game, I played 11a6. Um, now after rook e1, I'm already starting to feel a little bit of pressure. I wasn't sure what a good plan would be because I have this bad light square bishop. So compare this position to this one that we had with the light bishop straighted off. This is a much better position for black. Black has an advantage here, whereas in this position, white has the advantage because a6 was a bit too slow, and Michael was able to play rook e1, and all of a sudden now I'm starting to feel the pressure, and I'm low on time. So this, this is the point where I had 30 minutes. My opponent, Michael, had 52. So takeaway number one from this game is don't play so slowly in the opening, but to take that one step further, one thing I've started doing in my training is I've just been playing a ton of blitz games and I'm playing 3 plus 0 and after every single blitz game I've been going through and just taking a couple mental takeaways so I go through analyze them real quick figure out what I could have done differently and the reason this has been very effective um, as you'll see in the round 3 recap is because it's really gotten me playing at a sharper level so I'm just more quickly seeing these tactics and figuring out what to do without draining so much time. Just because I have 60 minutes, I don't want to burn through most of it and get into a position where my opponent has a lot more time on the clock when there's tactics coming up. So here what I did is I played queen to b4. And the idea was I still wanted to get this isolated queen pawn position, but I was hoping to get the knight to b4 and then back to d5. After c takes d, queen trade, um, here I played knight takes d5. I think knight to b4 is also a good move, and I considered it. But I went with knight takes d5, rook c1, developed my last minor piece. And now here I feel a little bit stuck. This is an equal position. You know, I think after the queen trade, white's lost a bit of his advantage. It's probably equal. But the issue is, in this equal position, how to play for a plan for black. And one issue that I've had in my chess career when playing the Karo Khan, and it's actually the reason I gave it up for the Sicilian, is that I tend to overpress equal positions out of the Karo. Um, but I think there's some learning points here for me because I actually did a pretty good job in the next few moves starting to gain an advantage, and I didn't need to overpress. So let's see what happens. Rook to d8. Knight to b3, eyeing this square, c5. But I think this is a bit of a mistake. I think Michael should have played knight to e4, eyeing both of these squares. Because after knight to b3, what I'm able to do is play b6, and my b-pawn guards c5. So this knight is shut out of the game currently. So he plays bishop e4, I reinforce the knight, rook c4, and now I have this nice move, bishop b5, improving the bishop while getting tempi on the rook. Rook back to c1, king to f7. So slowly I'm just improving every piece. I've got the blockade, I've got my bishop active, rook's coming to the c file, king guards e6, and these two pawns are doing a great job shutting down the white knights. So according to Stockfish here, I'm already up about 0.9. And I think that's something that I didn't appreciate during the game was how good the position was. So I kind of rushed it a bit. So here we see g3, rook c8. Because if white takes, I'm happy to take back. Knight b to d2. And now here I make a mistake. g5. So at this point when I played g5, I was down to 6 minutes remaining. And my opponent had 36. But what I should do here is play it a little bit slower. Play a move like g6. Um, now let's give white a move like he played in the game, bishop to b1. Idea being put the bishop on a2, pointing at this pawn. Now I could play a5. And a5 has this really cool idea where we can get the bishop tucked back onto b7. So let's say bishop to a2 here. I could play bishop to c6. We'll give white a kind of a random move, and this bishop can go to b7. 
So now everything is slightly improved and I don't have to rush it here. I can play my G5 idea later, but when I played G5 right away, there was actually bishop takes h7, and I was thinking, well, maybe we could go into a more tactical line, like rook takes rook, rook takes back, rook h8, this bishop retreats somewhere, rook takes h3, but now the problem is that rook on h3 is a little bit out of play, uh, even though I do have these c-file squares covered. I don't think that's what I wanted in the game. So we have bishop to b1 in the game after g5, and now here I play h6. I think this is fine, nice and solid. Knight to e4. Now at this point, rook takes c1 is a really strong move, um, but it's also okay to prep it. So I did go for bishop c6 first, and my idea was I'm going to tuck the bishop back on b7, but what's going to happen is after these trades, the centralized black king is going to be able to kind of march up the board and put some extra pressure on d4. So bishop to a2 was played. Um, I could have done bishop back to d7. I played rook to d7 here. I think bishop b7 was a little bit stronger, but my idea here is to, to try to double the rooks. Knight to c3. Bishop back to b7. And I did calculate out this line. It looks a little scary at first. After all the trades, the rook goes on c1. But my king's able to help out. So knight takes, rook takes, bishop takes. Takes d5, rook takes, rook c1. So it looks like white's better here. Rook is entering, c6 or c7. But after bishop d7, rook c7, I have this nice move, king e7. And actually everything is well defended. If the rook attacks the a-pawn, I push. If rook attacks the b-pawn, I have rook to b5. So Michael retreats. Now here again, I rush this position a little bit. And I think if you sit and look at the board, it makes more sense to bring the king up here. No reason to rush anything. But what I did was I played pawn to e5. And after d takes, f takes, now um, the white knight is kind of free to move. And all white has to do is get the knight to e3 to essentially get a drawn position with the blockade. And I did not appreciate that during the game, how strong that knight would be on e3. So let's see what happens. King h2, king e6, g4, play bishop to b5, king g3, rook d3, king g2. Now here, if I see this plan coming, Knight e2 followed by knight f1. I should play rook to d1 here. And this rook doesn't have any squares on the second rank. Um, because if rook here, I can go take, take, and we're getting this king and pawn endgame that's lost for white. This king is getting shut out. King f3, king d4, and you can see all of these squares are defended. And then my king can go after the um, queenside pawns over here. So king g2, e4, knight d2. I need to spot that the knight's going to f1 here, and I completely missed it. So I played king d5, and after knight f1, I realized we're headed towards a draw, and I actually made a mistake coming up. Um, so what I should have done here is played e3, not allow the knight to get to f1. After f takes e, rook takes e, I can still claim a small advantage here. The, the pieces are well placed, and white's pieces are defensive. So after rook c8, I made a mistake here, rook b3. Rook back to d2, and here we ended up agreeing to a draw. Um, and I think based on the time situation, I was down to two minutes. Michael had 24 minutes left. I really didn't want to try to overpress this. I think there's a good chance I might lose if I do anything too crazy. So the big takeaways from this game, play more blitz in between games. Just get more games in in general, and I've been doing that. Play a little bit faster, and also try to have a better understanding um, when I have an advantage to focus on the imbalances. And I think that's a little bit linked to the amount of time remaining. If you have time on the clock, you can check the imbalances and figure out 
is this a position that I need to press, or is this a position where I can just slowly improve the advantages that I already do have? So that's another takeaway for me. Really think about the imbalances, and we have a video on the imbalance scorecard. I'll put a link to that in the description below as well. Uh, you can check that out. But yeah, I think those are the two big takeaways, and it was just really fun to get back into the over-the-board chess. I really enjoyed it. Win, loss, or draw, I knew going into it. I was going to be happy no matter what. And this was a good game. Michael played well. Um, so I started out with half a point in the tournament. So stay tuned. We'll have a round two recap coming up soon. And please like the video and subscribe if you're not a subscriber. And if you're interested in joining Chess Goals, there's also going to be links in the description below. And there's info on the Carol Concourse as well. Thanks for watching and see you in the next video.